we've already been chatting, but I'm going to introduce myself anyways. I'm Andrew Fritz. I am a full-time professional photographer. We're here to talk about the solar eclipse coming up. Um, I'm a full-time professional photographer. I pay all my bills with photography. I'm also an instructor, and I'm teaching more and more classes at Precision and other places on my own. I am sort of a nature lover, um, and I'm, I'm a science nerd. I'm married to a scientist. I got most of the way through a PhD before I got frustrated with, with trying to deal with that. So um, you can see some of my sort of nature photography at Andrew Without Instagram and uh, amadtrip.com. Before we go any farther, yeah, we got more chairs. If we got to get more chairs, guys, come on in. We'll pack them in. Um, I want to tell everybody about North Austin Photographic Society. Uh, NAPFS, spelled like Paflugerville. Um, it's a local photo club. I'm one of the founders of it. It's club member run. It is not my club. It is the club members club. We do speakers. We do um, live critique competitions every month. There's socializing. We try to do field trips on a regular basis. We're going to Cars and Coffee as a club um, next week, the 13th, I believe. Yeah. So go check it out, napfs.club. We just had our meeting this month, so it'll be another month. But it's the first Thursdays when we have our meetings. So I'd love to see y'all's faces there. You can come to a meeting for free, come to a couple meetings for free. If you want to compete in the competition, you have to be a member. It's $24 a year. That's nothing. Like, it's easy to spend more than that on one person at dinner now. So come check us out. It's good. You'll have fun. Lots of good people. Right, Evelyn? Yes. <laughs> Way to answer. How many people in the room are club members? Yeah, raise your hands for a club member already. Yep, three or four. So lots of opportunity to make the club bigger. So we have, we're up to 68 members. Our goal for this year, it's our first year having official membership. Our goal was to have 100 members by the end of the year. And we're getting close. So I'd love to see some of you. Hopefully you enjoy the club and you want to take part too. But first. This is my first total solar eclipse. Who else is this their first total solar eclipse? Okay. So why am I giving a talk? This might be a question you're asking yourself. And to be frank, I was asked a bunch of times, and I said no a bunch of times. We wanted to teach a class. I didn't feel comfortable teaching a class when I was not experienced doing it. But it turns out almost no one has shot one because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Although there's another one that's going to come over Austin in 2024. So maybe it's twice in a lifetime. That said, I'm a technical guy, and I've spent a lot of time researching to figure out my own plans, and I'll be in Jackson, Wyoming, uh, near Grand Tetons, to shoot it uh, as part of a road trip I'm doing with Emily and Jasper back here for their wedding. Um, I figured, why not go to Tetons for it? So, um, and you teach astro and I teach astro astrophotography. Yeah, it is a star. <laughs> it is just a regular star. So um, I wrote an article probably three months ago uh, about my planning for the eclipse. And I've updated it a little bit, and I'm going to be updating it in the next couple of days. In the last two weeks, there have been like 50 articles that have come out on every major news outlet, photography outlet, about the eclipse. So there may be better articles than mine. I'm not going to claim otherwise. But I'm trying to make mine a hub. I'm trying to put stuff. So if you have a resource you know about that's good, I'd love to hear about it so I can add it a link to mine. I've got the core resources I've used. And this link shortener, azlx.li slash eclipse, will take you there. Um, and you'll see the same link shortener in a bunch of other slides. Just remember, it's all lowercase in all cases. If you put uppercase, it'll tell you you can't find it. You'll end up looking at wedding photos, which is not probably what you were looking for. Okay? But this is the Hub article. And this, pretty much everything I talk about, you can find there. Okay? So before we start, we kind of touched on this before, but I want to talk about safety. Because it's, it's very easy to injure yourself and your camera photographing the sun. Okay? Um, people who do bird photography or aircraft photography, you can blind yourself temporarily just sweeping across the sun with a big, fast, super telephoto. Okay? So you certainly don't want to point a telephoto at the sun and then look through the viewfinder. Like, that's a good way to blind yourself permanently. Um, high performance lenses gather an enormous amount of energy. And, and you're talking about focusing that sun onto a little tiny dot on the sensor. You, know, you could set an ant on fire with a cheap magnifying glass. Imagine what pointing high performance optics at the sun for an hour will do to your camera. Okay? So for your eyes, um, you need to look at it with proper glasses. <laughs> now, there's a certification that NASA manages, ISO 12312-2. And they're, of course, now behind because so many people have tried to start selling glasses in the last two months. There are two main makers of glasses, um, American Paper Optics and Rainbow Symphony. Okay? However, there are now people selling fakes 
that look identical to those on Amazon. So if you order glasses and you haven't ordered glasses already, it's probably best to order them directly from one of those two companies, not through Amazon. Um, on the Eclipse link that I showed you a minute ago, there's a link to a couple of the articles that talk about the fake glasses and some of the investigations that have happened. They look identical. They have all the proper stamps and marks, but they're not necessarily safe. And the problem is, if you see this, this is made from the same stuff the glasses are made from. It looks like balloon mylar. So guess what's in a lot of the fake glasses? And it is not designed to protect your eyes from UV. Okay? And UV will blind you. So as an alternative, because it's hard, getting hard to get your hands on glasses and filters now, a strength 14 or higher welding goggles, which are not that expensive at Home Depot or wherever, and because they're an industrial product, they tend to be pretty well policed, um, is a good alternative for that. You can also use one of the indirect methods of viewing the sun. I'm not going to talk about those. Um, but if you Google camera obscura or view sun indirectly, they'll show you how to make a camera obscura to view the sun during the eclipse. You won't get the same, you won't get the same experience you have during um, looking at it directly through the right glasses. You don't want to use glasses that are three years or older, that have wrinkles in them, that are maybe pinholes. Again, these are your eyes. You can't buy new eyes. Okay? And sunglasses are definitely not safe. Do not think your sunglasses will protect your eyes from the UV if you stare at the sun for 10 minutes. Uh, ND filter is not going to be enough. We'll talk about the camera. That's the next slide. So camera is a little different. So <coughs> your eyes you should not take a risk with, period. You cannot replace your eyes. Do not risk your eyes. If you don't have the right protection, don't look at the sun, period. Your camera, people trash cameras to get a shot all the time, OK? So if you don't want to destroy your camera, follow my rules. If you don't mind if you might potentially damage your camera, you can push these risks. You just do not want to look through the viewfinder. Okay, So this is going to gather an enormous amount of energy. So you never want to point a telephoto lens, telescope, or binoculars at the sun without protection in front, here, not here. So some super telephotos have an internal filter. If you put a solar filter there, you'll burn a hole in the solar filter. People have done it. You have to put the protection in front of the lens. You've got to stop the energy from getting into the lens. Okay? Um, my solar filter film has been bought from Thousand Oak Optics. Um, people have been telling me they're out of stock until at least the 17th. The eclipse is on the 21st. So I have photographed the sun, and my cameras have lived to tell the tale, through a 10-stop ND with a polarizing filter. This is not a money-back guarantee if you melt your camera. Okay? especially if you point your camera at the sun for more than about 20 seconds. Because what's happening, um, if you, very frequently I use live view, because I don't want to look through the viewfinder, because I'll blind myself. So that means the sensor is just having all that solar energy hitting the sensor continually, just all the time. It will heat up, and it can damage the sensor. Okay? If you want to sacrifice a camera because you can't get a filter, that's your business. Just don't hurt your eyes. That's all I care about. Okay? The other thing is, and people will do this, and you can damage your eyes if you're looking through the viewfinder, this is not going to fall off the way I've attached it, and we'll talk about that in a minute. If you tape it, make sure your tape is not going to come loose. I'm not a fan of tape because light can leak around the edges and you can get reflections off the back of the film, and you can't remove it during totality, which we're going to talk about why you want to do that as well. Okay? Because people stare at the sun during the eclipse. People, you almost never go out and go, ooh, and just stare at the sun, right? It hurts, so you stop. Right? If you look right at the sun when it's out, it's going to hurt. So it's the same sun power we're getting every day during the eclipse? Yes. Uh, it's actually even going to be a little bit less in the visible bands as the sun gets eclipsed. So it'll be deceptive that it's not as bright. It'll feel not as bright. But you're getting just as much UV, which is what will destroy your eyes. Okay. So he, he brings up a really good point, which is that it's not going to be any different than normal. So I, that picture on the opening slide I took of the sun just someday out in the, you know, standing in my room, uh, in my yard, and I did that with filter, but you have to be super careful because you can do it during the regular day. We just have an aversion to staring at the sun because it hurts. So if you, if you go, I'm going to look at the eclipse, and you power through it, you will end up damaging your eyes. So the only time you can look at the sun with your naked eyes is during a true total eclipse. We're going to talk about, there's three types of eclipses. We're going to talk about them. This is the totality. This one has totality. It's a real total eclipse. If you have an annular eclipse, I'll tell you what that means in a minute, you cannot look at the sun without protection. 
So during the two and a half minutes where I am, I'm going to be in Tetons when the moon is obscuring the entire photosphere, which is the part of the sun we call the sun. You can look at the sun with your naked eyes, and your camera can photograph the sun with itself naked. That sounds weird. <laughs> Let's get naked! Okay, partial annular in total. Okay. So during a partial eclipse, the, sun, the sun's track does not take it over the top of the sun completely. Everyone in the United States, continental United States, is going to be treated to a, a partial eclipse at least on the 21st. And Texas's partial eclipse, believe it or not, as far as we are from the track, is going to be pretty close to full. It's going to cover it like 85%, I think. 60%? Okay. Which is, which is a lot. It'll get, it'll get really dim and weird. Um, okay, that's a partial eclipse, okay? And I've seen partial eclipses, and most people probably have as well. So a to an annular eclipse is when the moon is at the far point of its elliptical orbit, so it's smaller from our point of view, and it's slightly smaller than the photosphere of the sun from our point of view, which means it never completely covers the photosphere, which is where you get the moon eclipsing the center of the sun, and you have this blazing ring of sun around the outside edge. Okay? You cannot look at the sun <laughs> without protection during an annular eclipse, even though the moon goes directly over the top of it, because it doesn't block the entire photosphere. You won't see the stars during, a, during an annular eclipse. You won't see the corona, because the photosphere, even that little tiny edge of the photosphere, is bright enough to wash all that stuff away. You don't ever see it. And then finally, we have a total solar eclipse, which is when the moon is at the near point of its orbit. From our point of view, it's very slightly larger than the sun, which means for about two and a half minutes, most places, two to two and a half minutes, most places along the track in the US, you have night during the day. You can see the stars. You can see the corona of the sun, which we never see any other time unless you go to space and use a special device to block the sun. It's going to get cold, er, depending on where you are. <laughs> Animals will act weird, and there's a bunch of visual effects that go with it. So we'll talk about those in a minute. So we're, this, the 21st, if you're on the track of totality, we'll talk about where that is, is going to be a total solar eclipse. So we'll have the sun completely blocked, the photosphere completely blocked by the moon. Okay. Um, totality is a weird thing, right? This is why this is such a big deal, because it doesn't happen very often, and it's not something we're used to seeing or expecting. Um, it's gonna be, there's going to be a noticeable temperature drop over the course of the eclipse because the amount of solar energy pouring into the Earth is going to drop. Um, the stars will come out during totality, at least a little bit. Um, the corona is going to be visible, and the corona is something we never see except in photographs. Uh, before the modern age, no one ever saw it at all unless there was a during an eclipse. Animals are going to act strange. There's reports of animals like trying to bed down for the night and then having to get back up because like it was noon. And then there's a couple visual phenomenon. Um, the, the diamond ring, Bailey's beads, and potentially shadow, uh, shadow bands. And rather than try to describe these to you, I'm going to give you a reference to a video that's really handy. Uh, Smarter Every Day is a guy who does sort of science smart content on the web. He's got a video about the eclipse where he talks to someone who's eclipse chased for decades, so a true eclipse expert. He has a really good video on it. If you go to uh, azlx.li slash sed eclipse, you'll get to that video on YouTube. It's a good watch. It's worth watching. And that, there's a link to that also on my Eclipse page. So if you already have the Eclipse page, you can navigate there to it, OK? Any questions so far? Now, all the things that are you showing are your, on your Eclipse page? Yeah, th pretty much. Uh, there'll be one or two. This link takes you directly there. But if you go to my Eclipse page, that video is in that Eclipse page. No, I'm just saying the things that you're showing on the slides are on that page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, that page ended up being like 3,500 words. So it's a long read. This is the, okay. this is the quick version. So during a total eclipse, location is everything. So let me give me a second here. I'm going to bring up a map. We're going to go to this map. So this is, there's a couple of these maps out there. This is the first one that I found, and I like it a lot. Um, eclipse map. Josh, do we have any questions from YouTube right now? Uh, Neat. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. So hopefully, I don't know. Maybe our hopefully our. 
Well, we're recording it, so hopefully we'll, we'll publish a... Yeah, there's a cable up here. I didn't bring a cable, but... Next time. This was, this was our experiment, so... Dang it. Okay, working without a mouse is really hard. There we go. Yeah, it may not be... The Wi-Fi may not be good enough to load the map. Okay. Oh, oh, here we go. Okay, good. So if you look at this map, you see this green area? Goes up over the Arctic Circle? That's everybody who's going to see partial eclipse. Okay? See the two red lines with the blue line in the center? That's your path of totality. That is the width of the moon's shadow as it crosses over the face of the Earth. Okay? Um, we're at a really interesting time in solar history where our moon's orbit is at the exact point to just barely give us a total solar eclipse occasionally. If it was much closer, we'd get them much more frequently and they'd cover a lot more of the Earth. And in like a couple hundred million years, it'll have moved out far enough in its orbit, it's very slowly moving out, where we won't get solar eclipse anymore. It won't be, ever be big enough to give us a full total solar eclipse anymore, okay? I mean, in the human time scale, that's forever, but sort of, it's sort of amazing that we're in a time when that can happen. So now, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna click uh, I'm going to go, ah, I forgot I was going to do this. I should have got your mouse, Josh. <laughs> okay. Okay, so here's Austin, Texas. So this, this little pop-up that comes up, and I'm going to show you how to use this site because it's a useful site, has a bunch of useful information. It says partial solar eclipse right here because if this was somewhere with totality, it would give you the totality information. So there's what totality maximum is going to look like approximately in Austin. That's the most eclipse you're going to get in Austin, okay? It's not bad, but it's nothing like totality. <laughs> so, there's also this table down below, and there's three times here. On where there's totality, there'll be four times, and I'll show you that in a minute. C1, C4, and max. So max is the time of maximum eclipse. It's in universal time, so you've got to convert to local time zone. It tells you the altitude in degrees the sun is going to be at, the azimuth, which is the compass angle, basically, it's going to be at. And then it tells you some other things that Honestly, I haven't bothered to figure out what they mean. <laughs> they're, they're astronomical data. They don't really matter if you're just trying to view the eclipse. Um, you can get really nerdy on this if you want. And I'm fully willing to admit I'm a photographer, not trying to be a solar astronomer. So there's stuff that, that I don't know about what these do. Um, let's, go look at, let's go look at roughly where I'm going to be. And I would zoom in to show you, but I'm going to be up near Grand Tetons. So this is going to see, see totality. Okay. Yes, ma'am. This line right here? That is, yeah, I, that's, that's the, the extent of the sun at that point. I'm not 100% sure exactly what that represents. No, the green line is where the eclipse ends right here. Oh, OK, that's twilight probably. Yeah, OK, so that's the region at which the sun is going to be coming up or setting. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. I don't live out here, so I didn't worry about trying to figure out what that was. I didn't figure anybody would have a problem with that. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't know, so now I know. No, no, that's, that's a good question. OK, so now on this table right here, um, at the location I clicked, I didn't quite get on the center track because it says my totality is going to be a minute and 58 seconds. Okay. The closer you are to that blue line, the longer your totality will be because the more exactly the moon's going to go over the center of the sun, the more of that time you're going to get. Okay, the second line here, lunar limb corrected. What they've done is they've actually determined how much difference in your totality time the contours on the surface of the moon are going to make from your point of view. <laughs> Sounds crazy, right? So the moon is not a perfect sphere. It's got mountain ranges and craters and all kinds of stuff. That makes a difference in how long your totality, about a half a second to a second, depending on where you are. So that's the lunar limb corrected one. Honestly, you're not a robot, so that half a second to a second is not going to change your experience of the eclipse much at all. If you're trying to do something really elaborate with a telescope, it might matter. Um, this down here is what really starts to matter. Okay? C1, C2, max, C3, C4. These are your contact times. And I'm going to tell you what those mean in just a minute. But I, this is how you find your contact times for various places. So if you're going to be over here in Nebraska, you just go on the map and scroll around until you find the street you're going to park on. And you click. 
and then you write all this down. And then check it three times. And then when you're on location, check with everybody else to make sure they have the same numbers, because you don't want to be like still setting up a camera when it happens. Although it should be pretty bloody obvious, frankly, because you know it's an eclipse. <laughs> it's going to get real dark. Um, so I mean, if you're there, it's not that big a deal. But it's good to good for planning purposes. Let me go back to the slideshow. So this is a good this is a good tool to explore. I think NASA has one as well. that's very similar. Um, so if you happen to see that, that's fine. Okay. So. On the day of the eclipse, the moon, which I should have made a much brighter color, I try to make it look dark because it's dark. There's the moon. Everybody see kind of the semicircle? C1 is when the, the trailing edge of the moon and the leading edge of the sun come into contact. Okay? C2, which will happen about an hour, an hour and a half later, two hours depending on where you are, is when the leading edge of the moon touches the trailing edge of the sun. That's when totality starts. At that point, you're going to get Bailey's beads and the diamond ring, which are effects that occur because of the topology on the moon and the last bit of the photosphere disappearing. So, go ahead. What's the duration of Bailey's beads? Seconds, is my understanding. Um, like, uh, I don't know if you were here for the first part. I haven't done this before. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm based on my research. It's quick. It's, it's not, not long. Uh, the diamond ring is the same thing. It's just a flash, basically, right as that last little bit of the of the photosphere goes away. The Smart Everyday video, they talk about it in more detail and there's some video of it happening. So it's, you know, quick. Yeah, it's going to be video or you're going to really be like 20 frames a second on an A9 or something. So they're visual effects. Okay, so I don't have pictures of them. I know, I'm sorry. Um, they're, the sun's going to shine through the topology and you're going to get, so Bailey's beads, it looks like diamonds, like little beads around the edge of the moon because you're seeing the photosphere through the topology of the moon. Uh, and the diamond ring, you get a really bright sparkling crescent as the last bit of the sun goes away. And you're getting basically a flare through your eyes and the atmosphere. Make sense? Okay. There we go. Okay. C2, oh sorry, C3. Uh, I skipped over max. Max is when the moon and the sun are directly over top. Nothing really happens at max. It's just the center of totality. There's no visual effects, it's just more totality. But max is the time they give you when it lets you know like this is the center of totality. Okay? So it doesn't make that much difference. C3 is when the trailing edge of the moon and the back edge of the sun lose contact. That's the end of the eclipse. Sorry, C4. Let me, let me go back. Okay, that's max. Not very visually obvious. C3, the back edge of the moon and the Sun, and then C4 is when the moon's here. I should have made this. I'm going to make this white next time, even though the moon's not white. So in, in 2024, I'll have this, my act together. <laughs> and then that's it. Show's over, OK? So between C1 and C2 and C3 and C4, that's your partial eclipse, even if you're in the totality area. And those are long and slow. They're like an hour plus. And it's just going to get darker and darker and darker. OK? So that's kind of the anatomy. Um, of an eclipse. So on, on the eclipse page, there's a link to the iOS and the Android version of an app. It's a talking eclipse timer. You tell it exactly where you are, and it will give you like, hey, it's an hour to totality. And then, hey, you have 10 minutes to totality. Get ready. Hey, you've got 10 seconds. Make sure you're ready to take your glasses off, and it'll take you through all the steps. It's like five bucks, so I bought it. It's actually pretty good. Uh, if you run a demo, just be aware you have to intentionally stop the demo, or the next day at whatever time the eclipse is going to happen for you, it'll start talking to you and you can't shut it up. <laughs> because the guy who wrote it made it very persistent because he didn't want you to miss the eclipse because you silenced your phone. So like, it will completely ignore silenced phones. It just, it's just going to talk. Okay? So let's talk about photography, because everybody here, who, who wants to photograph the eclipse in some form? Okay. This is going to be the most photographed astronomical event in history, bar none, period. So I will suggest that if you want to photograph it, that's great. I plan to. I'm going to have like five cameras out. But you could also just go and steer and wonder. That is perfectly OK. I'm not telling you not to photograph it. I'm telling you there's not going to be any shortage. And the pictures of this eclipse are not going to make anybody's <laughs> portfolio, OK? So if you want to do it, to do it for yourself, which is what I want to do, do it. But if you feel like, hey, i got to do this because i got to impress somebody, there's going to be there's going to be spectacular stuff from lots and lots of people who have lots of the specialized equipment, okay? 
Um, so, but let's say you're all going to keep, you're going to try to photograph it, okay? You're going to need a camera and a lens, a sturdy tripod, solar film, and a remote release if you're using a telephoto, which you will be using because otherwise the sun's just like one pixel across. So, let's talk about the lens first because that's going to be the most challenging thing for most people. The sun and the moon, for that matter, cover about a half a degree in the sky. If you think about your lenses, you can go look up the field of view on a lens. I want to say my 200 millimeter lens on a full frame camera is like 11 or 15 degrees field of view, which sounds narrow, but it's not. So if you run the math, it only covers 5% of the width of my frame on a full frame camera, which on my D810, which is a super high resolution camera, makes it 368 pixels across. That's not very big. That's, that's tiny, in fact, right? 500 millimeters, which is probably what I'm going to be using, because it's what I have, but I'll probably put it on my old D5000, so I have a, the extra 1.5 crop. But if I shot it on my, my D810, it's 12% of the width of the frame, or 883 pixels. That's getting a little more respectable, OK? If you're at 1,200 millimeters, who here has a 1,200 millimeter lens laying around? <laughs> oh, OK. Yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> or you're using a telescope uh, or a bird scope or something like that, you're going to get 29% of the width of your frame. Still only 30% of the width of your frame. That's, not, that's still not filling the whole frame. It's 2,000 pixels across. That's actually that's really excellent. So you're going to get good stuff if you do everything else right. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things that can go wrong and we get one shot, right? <laughs> this, this is going to be a stressful thing to photograph for most people because you get one shot. There's no dry run for the totality anyways. So the, the other thing we have to consider is that the sun moves a quarter degree in the sky per minute. In reality, the, the Earth is spinning a quarter degree per minute. So that means you've got to take the movement of the sun into account when you set up your rig. If you're shooting on a, a 1,200-millimeter lens, touching that camera is going to cause the sun to just go all over the place in the camera. So a lot of what people are... I'm seeing suggesting, and probably one of the things I'm going to do with at least one or two of my cameras, is I'm going to frame the camera a couple minutes before totality. I know my frame width because I know my field of view. So I know how far the sun's going to travel during the time. I'm going to set my camera with the sun on one side, where it's going to move across the frame over the course of totality, and then back out of totality. And then I'm just going to put it on continuous high and lock the shutter open. Or I'm going to run an intervalometer and shoot once every second for that five minutes. Of, of partiality. Of partiality. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you're on like a 50 millimeter, right. like a 50 millimeter will do that. But the sun's going to be tiny. Yeah. So if you're on a 200 millimeter, um, so on, my, on the eclipse page, there's a table of, of how far the sun's going to move, and there's an equation that tells you how to calculate how far the sun will go. If you really want to do this, um, the Smart Everyday video, um, he talks about another video, and you can, you can follow that, that link and go down that hole, where that person talks about the drift method, which is basically what I was just talking about, which is where you set your camera up and you start it with the sun on one side of the frame, and you start it at the right time, three or four minutes before totality, and let it run until three or four minutes after totality, and then the sun just kind of moves across your frame. You don't have to worry about trying to re-aim the camera, and you can enjoy the eclipse while your camera just does its thing. Um, so you can go look at... There's a field of view calculator on, or a link to a field of view table on my page. And I calculate how big the sun will be on various lenses on full frame, crop frame, and micro four thirds. So you can, get, you can get an idea. But the real takeaway here is you probably want at least, if you're on a full frame camera, uh, 500 is kind of your minimum to accomplish much. Okay? If you're on a crop frame, a 7200 and a 17 teleconverter get you over 500 equivalent. And that's the first photos, the photo at the opening of this, I took with that combination. And if you can get longer, if you're like him, and like, do you bird or do you sports cars or what do you do? Why do you have a 1200 millimeter lens? <laughs> I want to be friends. Um, um, if you happen to have an 800 or a 1200 or something else crazy like that, you're good. Okay, so we talked about movement. So here's the thing about the sun. <laughs> it's the sun, it doesn't change at least not from our perspective. 
So when you're trying to figure out how to shoot, you, have, you can't practice an eclipse because an eclipse happens in one day, but you can certainly practice shooting the sun at that time of day, which will tell you where the sun's going to be. You can get your exposure set up with your solar film. You can figure out, work out all the kinks of trying to aim the camera and getting the path of the sun across the frame correct, OK? Yeah, you may run into weird. You may run into weird things. So on a lot of ball heads, like if I do this, I can only. This one goes pretty far, but most ball heads have a notch, and so if you orient that notch correctly, you can go as far up as you need to go. But this is something you want to figure out before you get to Wyoming or Oklahoma, right? Mm -hmm. So go out tomorrow. Assuming you have film, solar film already, and practice. Uh, we're going to talk about exposure in a minute as well, and that's something else you can practice because before totality your exposure is going to be the same as it would be today. So if I'm not going to have totality, it's really just going to be two circles. It is, it, but it's so going to be cool. I, actually, a few clouds would help at interest. Y yes, it would. Um, that's a double-edged sword because they can, right. so during the Venus transit, which I photographed, we had a lot of clouds in DC. And it actually let me shoot essentially with a polarizing filter, nothing else, because it was stopping enough down. So clouds are pretty transparent when you're talking about photographing details in the sun. Um, but nobody else wants clouds, so you're just going to be out, out, of, <laughs> you're out of luck. <laughs> everybody, else is, everybody else is praying for no clouds. <laughs> OK, so let's talk about exposure. Anybody, before we go on, anybody have any questions? I know I'm going through a lot of stuff. Josh, anybody on YouTube? Are we still, are we still too defective? <laughs> OK, <laughs> nobody's watching. I'm guessing the stream is not keeping up. That's about normal. Because just got to encode it and chip it. OK. So if anybody, let me know if questions pop up. <laughs> so um, most solar film that I've seen, I have two different brands, actually. I have Thousand Oaks, and I have somebody else's. I don't remember what the other brand is. But they stop about 16 and a third stops. Right? So the big stopper, like Lee sells a big stopper for doing like daytime long exposures of water and stuff, it's 10 stops. This is 16 and a third. This is a huge amount of stopping. Like this blocks, I mean, this does not look like it transmits light, right? This is a mirror. Like I'm reflecting light on the ground down there. Um, and that's its job, is to block almost all the light. So, but you can go out when you have this, you can go out and you can photograph the sun and get your exposure for pre-totality, okay? I have found that for me, ISO 200 F8 1 1 thousandths works pretty well. What's that? About how long? How long what? Oh, a thousand. <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, until the sun changes brightness. <laughs> Probably at least a quarter billion years. <laughs> it's OK. I didn't know if you were trying to make a, like an astronomical time scale joke. <laughs> like, I don't, Probably another billion years at least. I don't know. Um, so go out and test. So if you, if you get your solar film, or you're going to use some other solution that's not technically kosher, but you're going to use it anyways because you can't get solar film, go try it, OK? You can test your exposure. You're going to, you're going to shoot the sun such that everything around it, uh, I should have really should have put that picture back in here. When you take a picture of the sun correctly, the sun should not be white. That, when you take the picture, your histogram is going to look like this. And that spike should be pretty much right in the center of your histogram. Otherwise, you're overexposing the sun, because the sun is your subject. So put it right in the middle of the histogram. It's going to feel like you're underexposing it, because the background is going to be completely black. Because the photosphere is freaking bright, right? It lights our entire planet. <laughs> so, so go practice that. But your tendency is going to be to overexpose. And if you don't do that, you'll actually see some detail. Like you'll see dimming towards the edges of the sun when you boost the contrast, because we're getting less the brightest part of the sun is the part, the center of the photosphere pointed at us. The edges, we're seeing that light, only the light that comes out obliquely to us. So it should dim towards the edges. You get a little bit of the limb of the sun. So during totality, though, is the big variable, right? Nobody's done that here, probably. If you've done this, you should be up here talking, not me. Um, from my research, and there's been a lot of people who've done this over the years, and a lot of this information was recorded during the film days when you couldn't guess and check, right? You just had to do it, and then you went back to the dark room and saw what you got, and then you waited another 20 years to try it again. 
the corona is about 20 stops darker than the photosphere. This is easily verified scientifically. NASA can probably tell you the same thing. Um, and I actually didn't receive that in stops. I received it as a it's 0 0.00000000001 is dark. And you just do the math to figure out how many doublings that is. But it's about 20, 20 stops. And it falls off really quickly away from the sun. Because the photosphere is this cloud of plasma around the sun that's being excited by the energy coming out of the sun, so it's glowing. It's basically atmosphere that's glowing. So it's not super bright, and it's going to get dimmer as you go away. So during totality, right before totality occurs or right after it occurs, you take your filter off. It's one of the reasons I don't like tape. Okay. And you probably need to up your exposure four stops. You can do that a couple of ways. I will probably up my ISO a couple stops and slow my shutter speed down two stops. So I'll go from 100 to 800, and then go from 1,000th to 500th of a second. So That's auto, auto ISO I really hesitate to use auto ISO. I've heard people saying they're going to use aperture priority, like aperture minus one. Mm -hmm. Aperture priority might work just fine. Yeah, if you're, doing, if you're doing time lapse, I would not use aperture priority because it'll be all over the place on you. Yeah, so time lapse, you almost always shoot manual or you do something to mitigate changes in brightness because otherwise your exposure ends up being all over the place. Um, you don't have to worry about this. No, you can go practice your exposure. To tomorrow, and just that's what you're going to use, and you're shooting digital, and you've got like four hours of partial, three hours of partial here, so just check it, and then adjust it, and then just let it go. So you actually, the really stressful part of this for me and most people trying to photograph totality is you only get one shot, and it's two minutes long, and you'd like to enjoy it, you know, <laughs> too. <laughs> so, yeah. Bum, bum, okay, um, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna probably run during totality. I'm probably gonna run my camera with the bracketing setup, like plus or minus five stops, and put it on its highest frame rate and just go. Brrr, wait a second. Brrr, and then when I know I've got that, I'll put my intervalometer back on and just let it click once a second the rest of the time. So I'm gonna get a couple frames where I get a bracket to see if I can get more corona away from the sun. And that also gives me a little bit of safety in case I get the exposure of the, of the, during totality, you're not photographing the sun. You're photographing the corona and the stars. So it gives me just a lot of opportunity to capture other things there. Does that make sense? OK. And then you're going to want to, yeah, you can take a shot and you can look at your histogram. And in all likelihood, it's going to be four stops bright. It's going to be very bright. Uh, sorry, it's going to be very dim, so you probably want to slow your shutter speed down and up your ISO. Or if you're not at maximum aperture already, open your aperture up. Any one of those will work. Um, I don't think I put focus in here, and we should talk about focus. So I'll talk about that now. Um, but during totality, you're going to, you can leave this off. You can take your glasses off after totality starts. You can take your glasses off. And you just got to make sure you put them on before totality ends at C2, C3. Um, your camera, you can take off slightly before totality, and you can put on slightly after. Okay, it's less critical. Um, any questions about this? Were about yeah, we'll talk about that in just a second. Right. Uh, how much could you say to bracket? I'm going to bracket as wide as it'll let me bracket. I can bracket, I think, nine stops total, plus or minus four. Plus the center one, it gives me nine stops. So The sun, the sun is pretty uniform. The sun is uniform. Well, the point is the filter seems to be killing all the, the color. Uh, it may be blocking the spectrum that way. I don't feel like this one does. Do you have the Thousand Oaks or do you have one of the other brands? Uh, it's not that brand. No. So yours may be blocking a different spectrum than mine's blocking. I use Photoshop to add color back. So what I did, what I, honestly, the, but honestly what I've done with mine is I've actually edited them in black and white and I use the color channels to accentuate the contrast in the sun. <laughs> And then I'll do highlight and shadow tinting to bring that color out, which is what NASA does. When you see the images and it says, this is a false color image, 
they've shot a thousand different wavelengths in black and white, and then they put them together in an artistic way. So for those of us who are not going to go to Nebraska, yep. we're not going to see partial. You're going to see partial. Nope. So practically, not an issue for you. You can, you can go out and you can follow this procedure. You can take your solar film and you can photograph the sun on a regular day, write that down, use it on that day, and you're done. And you're gonna have like three hours, so you can check it, adjust it, and then let it go. Um, I suggested it two days. Doing yeah. That. Saturday, Sunday, and you're ready to go by home Monday. Yeah, depends on how depends on how how important you think getting photos of the eclipse are. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I have alternate sites. We will be getting up and driving a long way if it's cloudy in in Jackson today. It looks like it's gonna be cloudy because I want to see totality. So who here is planning to see totality? I'm just curious. Wow, OK, a lot of y'all are going to see totality. OK, cool. OK. So at the end of totality, so right before C3, you want to put your glasses back on because you can't look at the sun at all naked eyed. You can wait till C3 occurs, until the diamond ring and Bailey's beads happen, and then put, your, put this back on because this won't be damaged instantly. But if you let it soak up a lot of solar energy, it will be. Uh, and then you want to adjust your, don't forget to put your exposure back down and you'll, you'll underexpose, um, sorry, you'll overexpose the partial. Totality, true totality is the only time you can view the, the sun and when it's technically safe to have your camera look at the sun. Because you're not seeing what we call the sun, you're seeing the corona. Um, because believe it or not, the moon is actually opaque to the sun. I think that's, OK, so let's talk about focusing, because clearly I needed a slide for focusing. So the sun is bright, right? Reference needed. Um, with your solar film on, you can autofocus on the sun. And that is actually my advice. Get your camera to autofocus, and then put it in manual focus, and don't touch the focus wheel. Because your camera's autofocus system will do a better job of autofocusing, of focusing on the sun and getting it tack sharp then your eyes will. If you can't get it to do that, because this blocks enough light that even pointed at the sun, it doesn't, the autofocus system doesn't get enough light, which I, don't, I think every camera in the world now will autofocus through this stuff with the sun in the frame. You can go to live view, zoom in and scroll over till you're looking at the edge of the sun, and just, it's gonna be really jumpy even with the image stabilization because you're touching that lens, the long lens is really jumpy. But just very gently tweak it until the edge of the sun and let the camera settle because it'll be shaking and until the edge of that sun is just super sharp, okay, in manual focus. Those are the two methods I would use. Question. Uh, I focus on the edge. Yep. But I talked to somebody else, a photographer, and he said sunspot. If, you, if there's a big enough sunspot, so what you need is a contrast edge. Um, there's not going to be a difference in focus distance effectively from the lens's point of view between the front edge and the edge of the sun. Like the sun's big, but it's so far from us. Yeah. If there's a big sunspot, it's an option. But uh, the edge of the sun's always there, and it's a sharp, hard edge. Okay, so a sunspot is not there all the time. No, because sunspots come and go. They orbit. So you'll see if you go look at if you just Google sunspot video, like NASA has solar observatory, and they'll you can watch the sunspots orbit the sun and they come and go. Because they're basically a cool spot in the photosphere caused by contracting uh, magnetic field lines. Does that make sense? So it's a spot where the, the photosphere has gotten cooled just due to the magnetic field preventing energy input. Okay, so any other questions? Yeah, how do you put this together? Oh, yeah, I saw people I talk about that. Okay. So when you buy this solar film, it looks like a little mylar sheet. And I meant to bring mine, and I forgot, and I apologize. Um, did, you bring your, did you bring glasses or not, Emily? Okay, I forgot mine. So I'm not going to make you get it out, but it's, it comes in a little two pieces of cardboard like that, and it looks like a plastic sheet, OK? You don't want to scratch it. You don't want to wrinkle it. You've got to be gentle, t treat it gentle. I used foam core for this one. My previous one, I used just hard cardboard. It doesn't really matter. I cut a square out that's plenty big compared to the front of my, of my lens. And then I cut a circle in two sheets of that that are the same size as the front element of my lens. Use a compass, draw a circle, take a razor blade and cut it real, you know, find someone who's good at crafts if you're not. And then I take a piece of this that I cut just a little smaller than, than this square, but bigger than this, and I tape it down. 
and then I tape these two together. I take a strip of black, you know, 50 cent poster board, and I cut the edge of it, and I curl it into a circle and tape it, and tape it down. Right? No, one layer. Because that would give you 36 stops, which is not really, or 32 stops, which is not really what you want. Two of the foam core. I sandwich, what's happened here is I sandwiched the, the film between two layers. All right, so this is, this is kind of like your kindergarten craft project. Just get into kindergartner mode and you'll be good. Uh, I bought mine from Amazon, but everybody's saying they're out. But look and see. Yeah. Yeah, I would I use Google and see if you can find somewhere. I bought mine from Amazon three months ago. We should have we should have could have done this three months ago, but I don't think we would have gotten this attendance because nobody realized the eclipse was coming. But people like me and you, yeah, there were people who were way ahead of the curve, and some people just <coughs> until the news outlets picked it up in the last month, no one else has really noticed it. So, any other questions? But the, the brand is Thousand Oak. This is Thousand Oak Optics. There's another brand, and I can't remember it right now. Seymour Solar. Seymour Solar. Okay. <coughs> that's another one I recognize. The other thing I'm going to say about building these, if you have a lens like this one, you've got to be careful. You want to build it with it in the zoom position it's going to be in. Because some of the lenses, this is smaller than this. And so if you build it for this and then you zoom it out, it'll be loose. So just make sure it fits snugly here. And it doesn't have to be super tight. You just don't want it to be flopping around where it can fall off or blow off. You could, build it for the lens and stick the lens you could do that as well. I want it as close to the lens element as possible so that if there's any, anything on it, it's the farthest out of focus. And there, there one thing that I saw too was that Yeah, and I've seen people tape it. I'm not a fan of taping it. But if you want to do that, you can. Yeah, it's just a piece of, it's just a strip of poster board, and I, you cut it in little notches so you can bend those out and you have a flat surface. See, it's just taped right here. I mean, it really, it really is like, just think like a kindergartner. <laughs> I think I'm a slow guy in class here. Uh, would you say, uh, regarding focus, would you recommend to use autofocus? If autofocus will grab the sun through the solar filter, that will give you the best focus. The, the problem with modern cameras, not the problem, but the way modern lenses are designed, they don't have an infinity stop. They can focus past infinity. They do that because the autofocus will do a better job than any calibration of an infinity stop can do. So they let the, the autofocus just focus all the way out, which means you can't just focus to infinity because it'll be autofocus. There's no stop. So you always want to use autofocus if possible. If you can't use autofocus, go to live view with the film on. Zoom in on the edge of the sun. You know, get your exposure right first, and it, it'll be hard to find the sun. You know, maybe crank it all the way out close to infinity manually. Put it on manual focus, and then just really, really gently adjust it, looking at the zoomed-in edge of the sun. Or if you're on like a GH4 or something that has fly-by-wire focus, you can do it on the back of the camera. That's even easier. After focusing, is it recommended to tape the? Uh... I I do not because. I find that you will frequently move the focus ring when you do that. I just don't touch it. And on a super telephoto, this is going to be zoomed all the way in before I start doing anything else. I'm not going near that lens. Right? I'm not going to I just you just have to be careful. And I, we do this a lot during night photography because I do the same thing. You you set your focus and then you just don't touch that focus ring again while you're shooting night photography. Same principle. Um Mirrorless cameras, you're basically going to be in live view all the time. So on a DSLR, if you're not using live view, if you don't have a filter, I talked about it's hard to get filters right now, a lot of that energy is coming out of the back of here. So a DSLR is not, the sensor is not absorbing the amount of energy that it could in live view. Some sort of filtration and blocking on the front of your camera is going to be more critical because you're basically going to be lasering the sensor the entire time. So if you're using a mirrorless camera, Trying to get something to filter it, at least some, is important. Again, the, the official what's safe is you need proper solar film. There are probably some alternatives. A 10-stop and a polarizing filter is better than nothing. 
and you're just going to be risking your camera because you're not you're not looking through an optical viewfinder to do this. You don't have to worry about damaging your eyes. That's the main thing. So you might you might do some googling and see if you find any advice there. I'm hesitant to say, oh, we'll just do it and risk the camera, but it's, people have different tolerances for risk, right? We go on lakes and stuff with our camera because we want the shot. Yes, I believe so. I believe so. And if you want to capture them, what I've been told if you want to capture them is you really got to be at the right split second, which means either shooting video or you're rocking it you know, 10, 15 frames a second right around that time. Mm -hmm. So then timing gets really precise and you have to worry about filling buffers up and all that. Um, you should be able to see them because they're, they're an artifact of the full bright sun. They're the last vestige of the, of the brightness of the sun before you go into full eclipse. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm a little influenced by this sometimes. We're a little crazy. What might happen to my camera? What might happen to your camera? So if you're on a DSLR, probably nothing. Because most of that energy, if you're shooting stills, is coming out this. The mirror is deflecting most of it. It could damage your autofocus sensor. The camera's going to get hot. It could damage the batteries. It could damage the circuit boards. Okay. It could potentially damage the optics and the lens as well. Unlikely that it would, but it could. If you're on a mirrorless camera, all that energy is going straight into the sensor. I play with the Nikon. They're playing with iPods. Well, play? okay, so here's some, yeah, so here's the thing about an iPod. I've been talking about telephotos. Absolutely. We shoot with wide angle lenses and get the sun in the frame all the time. They are not concentrating the energy of the sun. They're not magnifying the sun. Right. So they are not a danger. So if you're shooting with a 24 or 35 equivalent lens, it doesn't matter. You don't need solar film for that. We do that all the time, time lapses with the sun in the frame. It's when you start shooting at 85, 100, 200, 500, 1,000 millimeters that you're really gathering a ton of energy just in the sun and you're pumping it into the sensor. So I'm playing with 200. I should be yeah. filtered. But an iPad, as long as they're wide angle, you should be fine. Because they're not gathering that much light from the sun itself. When you say a filter, what type of filter? Oh, oh you're fine. Okay. So the whole point of this, this, this prevents the energy from getting into the system. Okay. Right? It only lets a tiny, tiny fraction through. And if you don't have this, all that energy is coming in. Okay? And so it's being left in the camera. It goes somewhere, right? Bill? No okay. Well, you raised your hand. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're a well-trained man. <laughs> Oh, I think that's probably likely if you have the right point of view. You need to be high and be able to see the ground. And remember, it's going to move from west to east. So I didn't talk about this because it didn't really matter. The shadow is going to move from west to east. The eclipse starts in Oregon and moves across to the east coast of to South Carolina. Yeah, it's the moon's, it's the moon's orbit. So you, just bear in mind that if you're going to try to do that, you've got to face west. Oh, so, so here's how he, you, you missed one step. You're going to focus, and then you're going to turn your manual focus. You're going to turn focusing off. Because once you're in manual focus, the sun doesn't get any farther away or closer. <laughs> well, eventually it will, but not in the time scale we're talking about. <laughs> It'll get real close pretty soon, but only in like a cosmological time scale. Yeah, back button focus is just focus, autofocus. Um, so if anybody didn't know, there's two ways to trigger your autofocus on most cameras. Half press the shutter button, or if you have back button focus configured, there's a button on the back of your camera that does it. They both just do exactly the same thing. They tell the autofocus system, hey, focus. Some lenses have that on With a, That's a function of the body. Oh, some lenses may have a button focus. Oh, no, that's not what I'm talking about. So back button focus is a way to get the autofocus system to, an, to come on. So just like trying to take a picture and use this button, you can do it back here. What you're talking about disables autofocus altogether or enables it altogether. 
So for what we're talking about for focus on the sun, you want to focus in autofocus, and then you want to flip that switch to manual focus. Turn autofocus off. Turn autofocus off. Correct. Correct. And make sure you do the same with the lens. You just got an autofocus. Yeah, I turn it off. I turn it off on the lens always, because then it's at the. I turn the autofocus off of my lens. This is that's how I do it. Any more questions? Thank you. And there was a real good F-Stoppers article. Uh, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna go back because in the last week, two weeks, there's been a ton of resources that have come out. I'm gonna try to add them to the quick links at the top of that Eclipse page in the next day or two. Um, there's a ton of videos on doing this. I'm by no means the only source or the best source necessarily. So if you're if you're curious, YouTube is a great resource. I would try to stick to people who have a an edu uh, a background in education who have a reputation as being an education channel. Um, there are a lot of people who do funny reviews and stuff, and they're fine, but they're, they're there for entertainment, not necessarily the technical part. So find someone who's good at explaining the technical. So if I didn't explain it in the way you understand, there's probably somebody else who did. Uh, are you familiar with uh, Mega Movie Group? Uh, I, that was where they're going to try to get, collect photos from everybody across the country and put together, yeah, I know what that is. So tell, tell us about it. <laughs> I just did. Um, I haven't paid much attention to it, honestly. I'm aware of it. So there's a group that's going to try to collect photography and video from all over the country to make kind of a, a meta movie about the eclipse. Um, like I said, this will be the most photographed astronomical event in history. Well, I did register. I'm part of that group. OK. And what I've been enjoying so far is people are sending in questions or comments. And you get to read it. And I mean, I've learned a whole bunch just from somebody else's questions and somebody that Okay, so that's probably a good place to go to find people who've done it before. <laughs> Instead of coming to me. Okay, you can go uh, Eclipse 2017, and uh, they'll take you to the main. And then after you register, you uh, belong to the uh, magamovie.org. And I'll, I'll go ahead and add a link to that. I should have added it already. I'll add it to my Eclipse page. So if you go to my Eclipse link, give me, give me like four hours. So look tomorrow morning. I'll have added that link there, and you can find it there. Oh, another thing. Today is the last day to register. Oh, OK. OK, so don't wait till tomorrow to look. Look tonight. <laughs> uh, I'm using uh, 70 to 300 OK, on a crop frame? What, what, camera, what camera body? Uh, uh, Canon 70 to OK, so crop frame. So you have a 1.6 crop, OK? Yeah. It's called lens creep. Yeah, do you have a solution for that? Gaffer's tape. Or Gaffer's or tape. Or put the band that like people wear, like the Livestrong band. Yeah. And as long as it's secure, you can slide it up and hold it. Yeah. yeah. Gap, gaffer's tape or something like that. You just have to improvise in a solution. Okay. So if your if your lens creeps, what he's talking about? A lot of zoom lenses, when you point them up or down, they'll mm -hmm. slide one way or the other. Gaffer's tape. And, and gaffer's tape is kind of like fancy duct tape. Don't use duct tape because you'll end up with residue stuck to your lens. Gaffer's tape is designed not to leave any residue. So gaffer's tape, masking tape might work, like painter's tape, because it's designed not to leave any rev residue. Or improvise some other solution. I mean, you just got to, you just got to engineer something, right? Yeah, like an ace, ba an, an ace bandage might work. Medical tape, whatever you got handy. OK, one more question. Yep. So getting a big zoom lens, should I mount it on the tripod for the lens now? Yes. The reason you do this is because when you start going to these big lenses, this weighs so much. If you do it here, you're torquing your thing. Okay. And this balances across the tripod. And this mount is designed to hold this much weight. If you do it the other direction, you risk damaging your mount. You risk not having the lens in good alignment. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you always want to, if it has a foot, you want to try to use the foot. That's why they put the foot there. It also makes it a lot easier to aim and stuff because now it's balanced. When you have it out there on the end, it, it, like you barely release it and it does this. Other questions? Are you going to put a spot on your website so you can upload shots or 
Um, that's a good idea. So we've been doing month, we just did our first live critique. We might make the September 1 eclipse photos. So we might do a live critique of eclipse photos. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, we might, we might do, yeah, we'll also have eclipse photos. Um, he's he's got to stay here and hold on the fort. <laughs> Anyone want to find a circle up and try to find look? Okay. It's book, yeah. Yeah, this is sleeping in your car. So I will say. Yeah, you can. So don't. Here's here's the key. Don't go to a major place if you don't have a location already. It's going to look the same whether you're in a cornfield in Nebraska or in Oklahoma, and you can stay 200 miles away. You just got to get up early that morning and drive out and find a spot on the side of the highway. Also, keep in mind if it's if it's you, if you do have clouds. Go somewhere else. Yeah, well, they wouldn't be accurate. So I use right. so if you're looking for a cloud cover forecast, I use Weather Underground. If you go on their website and you scroll down on the little graph, if you click the gear, you can turn on cloud cover percentage, and it's way more useful than clear, partly cloudy, cloudy, because it'll say clear and there'll be clouds. Their, their app on their phone is good too. Very yeah, accurate. yeah. So you know, a day or two out, I should this question. Thank you. So, anyways, that's what I use for that. And just if you go to see it, if you're going to take the time to drive. Look the night before, and if you've got to go somewhere else, get up early and hit the road going east or west down that track and just drive till you got clear skies. <laughs> Which may be really annoying, but it's what you got to do. Okay, I think we're going to call it. We're gonna call it